keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Good morning, church. How you guys doing today? Nice. Hey, uh, my name is Chris Rusin, and I get the privilege of being lead pastor here at Lincoln Heights. I'm excited about today. We're diving into this, uh, we're continuing this, this new sermon series called Undistracted. Who you saw there is Bob, Bob Goff, and he wrote this book, Undistracted. I want to encourage you guys, pick it up in the lobby. We have them for sale back there, 15 bucks, or get it off Kindle. Um, the reason I picked this is because I really believe after, again, what we've been through the last couple of years, we, we can easily get distracted. We got to get a little more focused on really understanding our, our purpose of life again and what we're here, get some joy back in our life and not feeling so numb anymore. Uh, so if this is the first time any of you with me on one of these book series, I want to clarify what I'm not doing, okay? I'm not replacing the Bible with some book. I use books like this strategically as a, a springboard into the Bible to talk about these conversations, these subjects. So here we go. Let's get, get right to it. Here we go. The first question, do you want to live undistracted in your relationships? Do you want that? I think you do. I think you want it. I think there's uh, examples of all time in my life. I got wife, four kids, and I'm sitting down at the table having food, you know, having dinner or whatever with them. And I'm present physically there, but I'm not there really just mentally. I'm somewhere else. My mind's just kind of going and uh, kind of checked out sometimes. That might be you. You might be feeling that at work too when it comes to your work friends or church friends or neighbors or family. Do you want to be undistracted? in your relationships. I, I like it how it says this in Romans, the message version says, may our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. This incredible God, this amazing creator, he loves you. You know what else he loves? You being in a relationship with other people. He wants you to have that. It's part of the whole beauty of what he's created. But yet, let's just be honest. Sometimes people suck. They just do, okay? And they suck the life right out of you. you know? And they just make it be really not fun. And we have valid hurts. In the room, online, you're watching, welcome. Valid hurts that we have allowed to get into our system a little too much. And it's impacting us in a way that goes, you know what? I'm just not going to try as hard with people. I'm just not going to try as hard. And, and he, I mean, God's like, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm, I, I'm maturing you in you something. I'm, I'm growing you still. I want you to understand how good it is to be connected with others. And then the verse keeps going on. Then we'll be a choir. Okay, when we do this. When we're all connected, we'll be a choir. Not our voices only, but our very lives. Singing in harmony. I love that. In a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. It's like... God goes, I created this incredible world, universe, galaxies, everything, all for you to have this incredible relationship with me and with other people. And when we really step into that, have it with God and other people, and we experience that, it's like what's going to happen back is this like beautiful sound and praise like, thank you, God. And God's like, yes, that's what I want you guys to have. Relationships that are healthy and matter and give life, not suck it from you. So here's the video, my one of my favorite illustrations of what it looks like, what this passage to me looks like, what it looks like to be in healthy relationships with people and the sound it makes to God. <laughs> I just love, I, I, I love that, I love that song. I, I, I would probably tell you because I have four girls, like Chris, you love it because you love it. That's true, I do love it, okay. I love the song. It's a great song, One Directions. You know, you know, that's what makes you beautiful. And it made me think about, you know, just, just this idea too. What makes life beautiful are the relationships that God wants you to have with him and with others. That's what makes life beautiful. And, and you look at that video and you think, I didn't know a piano could do that. I, don't, you know, I didn't know that many people could, could be a, a part of a piano and make that kind of sound. Maybe that's how you're viewing life. You didn't know life could do that. And you've been so, uh, so distracted with your life that you've just got maybe one person on that piano. Two, you're so focused on that boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, so focused on that kid, on that spouse, so focused on that best friend. You tell yourself there's no need to have more than one or two people around my piano. And God's like, hold on. 
this, I've designed this piano to work best when people are surrounding it. I've designed your life to sound incredible. When you bring people in around you, I've designed their lives to sound incredible when I bring you around them. You see this, today's topic, this idea of being distracted and undistracted, I want, you to, I want to help you manage the distractions. Today we're talking about the value and the vehicle of managing the distractions in your relationships. I want you to understand the value. And the value, I'm just going to just be right to it. The value is what you just saw. That's the value. Life begins to sound and look a way like you've never seen before. But God understands and designed it to be and look like. But what's the vehicle you should live in daily in order to make sure you are managing the distractions around you on a regular basis? Because they will come and they will be there. They're already there. So I have a few questions. Just a few. Number one. The first question is what is something that might be distracting you from building better relationships? What is something? Just think of something. What could be a distraction? I think there are plenty of external distractions, plenty. I mean, we could be here all day talking about you know, people online, people you know, online are in the room. We should be sharing things with each other, going, you know what, I got my job. That's a distraction, you know. Maybe it's like you know, my schedule. So I'm so busy. I don't have time for people. I barely have time for my close loved ones, you know. Or maybe I, I got, you know, a distraction is like your, your, your TV time, your sport, your hobby, your physical fitness commitment. You're like, yeah, I'm just all about working out. I don't have time for anyone else, you know. I'm all about this, baby, <laughs> whatever. These are distractions. They can be external ones that get in between you and other people. And you experiencing that kind of piano life. But besides the external ones, I want to go deeper today and have you think about internal distractions. There are internal distractions inside of us that are creating a wedge between us and others. And these distractions, these internal ones, I think they're surrounded in birth and fear. The fear of missing out. The fear of rejection. Your fear of failure and your fear of loss. Think about the, the fear of missing out. You sit down to have maybe lunch with a colleague, a friend, a neighbor, or whatever, but you're too worried about what's happening on your phone. You don't want to miss it. You, you don't want to miss that, that post, that tweet. You don't want to miss that, that, that news about that party. And you're just like, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, can we hurry up here? I just hurt. You're not being present. Your fear, you're afraid of missing out somehow. Or the fear of rejection. That's easy, right? You're like, I don't want to connect with people. Whether it be dating or whether it be friendships, whether it be like in a church group. Because I don't want people to really understand who I am. I work hard at keeping up this perception and this front so it all looks good. If I start letting people see me, that's not going to be a bad thing. Because if they see me and they see my hurt, my pain, my habits, my hang-ups, my addictions, they're going to think I'm weird and what? Reject we tell ourselves a story. I'm not going to let them see me. I'm going to let them see the happy-go-lucky me that laughs at everything they say. Because that's what they want to hear. Or that's what you think they want to see or hear. Then you have the fear of failure. Why even try? Why even get back to dating? Why, why even try to expand and grow my friendships? You know, I had some good ones in high school. Had a few in college. You know, it's like I got busy. You know, I had, you know my life got busy. You know, why even try? Because they don't work out. You end up moving away, they move away. Or just something happens because people suck and it's just going to fail. Why? You know, and we tell ourselves these things. Why should I even try? It's just going to fail. But what that is, is showing your cards. When I do that, I'm showing my cards. I'm just afraid of it failing. And the final one, the fear of loss. This is a, this is a real one. All these are real, by the way. The fear of loss is, why do I want to try again? Why do I want to date? Why do I want to get married again when I'm just going to lose them? They left me before. Or they passed away. I just, I don't want to deal with that again. It hurts too bad to love that much and see those people hurt me that much. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. It's the fear of loss. And every single one of these are valid and real. 
Every single one of them. If someone tells you you're stupid for feeling that way, they're wrong and they don't understand what it means to be human. This is humanity. It doesn't mean it's healthy for us, though. But it is something we can all connect them. You see, when fear gets into our head and we start allowing it to do so, it has an impact on us that looks a lot like this. <laughs> she's just, she just, she just doing her thing, and all of a sudden, bam, you know? And that's what fear does. It just whacks you upside the head. It gets in your head. And what happens, it, it eventually removes you from community. Now you're not even a part of the band anymore. You're not a part of the orchestra. You're not a part of community. You've been removed because of fear. But Chris, it was a valid fear. She got hit in the head. I know, and your fear is valid too. You got hit in the head, right? It's painful, right? And we don't know the story of what happened to this girl when she came back, but I'm telling you, if there was a part two, it's coming back with a bandage going, let's do this again, okay? (laughs) And you get back in there. And friends, I'm telling you, fear has a way of messing us up. And then, then I read in that context, talking about the context of relationships, Then I hear this Hobby Lobby verse hit me a whole new way. And this is a great Hobby Lobby verse. I call those things Hobby Lobby verse because they're common. You see them on mugs, blankets, pictures, you know, whatever. You know, grandma has it somewhere. And it's there is no fear in love, right? But perfect love drives out fear. And you read that and you're like, amen, right? But do you know what it means? In the context of this relationship thing, Of course, we we understand that fear can mess up the idea of love. And we can get on board with that phrase. But the idea of perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love, let me just describe for you, it is not a warm feeling. It is not the world's love. It is not just a, a nice gesture or a good, you know, good intent, positive vibes. The perfect love talking about here is Jesus Christ. It's only by his power that he is able to work into our minds, into our souls, and drive, get this, not just kind of push out, it's drive out. Like linebackers that practice on a football field, just pushing that thing back out of your life. This is the role that Jesus can play in your life. This is where it makes sense to me of why you even do this Jesus thing. Stuff like this. He's the one who's able to retrain our brains, our hearts. We're so conditioned in our world to believe, no, you cannot ever go down that road again. And God's like, you can with me. I can help you. I can help you. Because you were designed to be a piano with people around it. And you were designed to be around someone else's piano. You were designed to make this incredible music and you have sought yourself out. You're sitting on the bench. Get back in. See, perfect love, it drives out fear. And he wants to drive out the fear in your life today, I believe. Again, we're talking about the value and the vehicle of managing the distractions in your relationships. I think you get the value that somehow we're created to really need these people in this community around us. And the first and foremost value, again, is found in this here right with with the Lord. Allowing him to really (laughs) drive out the fear that exists here with others. That leads me to question number two. Are you aware of what you can build upon a foundation of fear? If you let it. Are you aware of what might be already being built in your life right now? Are you self-aware to see it and how it's birthed from the fear that you've allowed to become a foundation in your life when it comes to your relationships? Are you aware of what can be built upon the foundation of fear? And I help you understand this a little bit. Check this video out because it really got my attention.
Ah, oh, fear. You can build a lot on fear, actually. You can build a, an incredible, well, a, a incredibly scripted life on fear. You can build a scripted life on a foundation of fear that's pretty magnificent, but eventually it will, be, it will come crashing down. It's not strong enough. It wasn't meant to be the foundation, the foundation you build upon. And if you do build upon it, it will result in relationships suffering. You, again, afraid of losing someone, afraid of, of failure, afraid of being rejected. And then what that causes you to do is become a person that you know you're not. You start becoming dishonest with people. And then they eventually see it, and it falls apart. Almost like you were dooming it from the beginning, and you were when you build a relationship based upon fear. Speaking of fear, that's where we're going to get into this next part of this conversation. I'm going to tell a story about Acts chapter 5 about Ananias and Sapphira. I'm going to be a little, little heads up here. I've only preached this, uh, this passage twice in my ministry career, and it's for a reason, because it really is a bummer. It's a bummer passage. It's not a lot of fun. But I, I believe there's power in it, like, any, like all parts of Scripture, and I want to help you see the story and, and what it means and what it looks like to have a life built on a foundation of fear. See, in Acts, and that's where we're out here, if you have your Bibles, go there. If not, just get your phones or, or just follow along. I understand you have Old Testament, okay. You have New Testament, and the New Testament is where Jesus, God in the flesh, God himself, becomes his creation. And then Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the first four books in the New Testament. They're called the Gospels. And really we, we hear all about the life and teachings of Jesus. We hear about how he died on the cross, how he, he was buried and rose the third day to, to, to prove that he is who he says he is. That he is God in the flesh. And has always been. He wasn't born on Christmas Day, you know, 2000. He's always been around. We just saw this part of God at this time in history. And then Acts is the first book, his Bible means book of books. Acts is the first book after the story of Jesus. And what Acts is short for is the Acts of the Disciples, the Acts of the Church. And we have mention of Church 1.0 in the book of Acts, the way it should be. It, guys, it's amazing. If you read the first few like, chapters of Acts, it's like Holy Spirit, it's power, it's people loving people, it's people getting, it's the church, again, not the building or institution, but the people. Getting the attention of other people saying, man, they're pretty cool. They love authentically. People are, are having meals together, sharing their time with each other. They're getting around that piano and their lives on multiple occasions. They are um, selling property. I mean, even the chapter before Acts 5, Acts 4, a guy named Barnabas sells real estate, his own property, brings in the full amount and places it before church leadership and goes, here, use it to expand the kingdom. Use it. I mean, and everyone sees that and you're like, Bleh! <laughs> and then there's Acts 5. And Acts 5 is, I believe, put there, and a lot of commentators uh, talk about this too, put there to help us remember something, that people suck. Even Christian people suck. We do. We make bad decisions sometimes. And there's no perfect people. There's no perfect church. There's just perfect God. And he loves us still in spite of our imperfections. And we see this played out in the store of Ananias and Sapphira. Because what they do is something that is hurtful and deceitful. Here it says this. There was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the, to the, to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. This is the big deal here. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. No bueno. It's already building up. And... and and then what happens here is, again, it wasn't so mad that he sold the property. It isn't, he, didn't, he didn't have to give the money to the church. What was really wrong and unhealthy here is that he said, I sold it for X amount, and here's X amount. And almost like, remember what Barnabas got a round of applause? How about one for me? <laughs> Woo! Nailed it, buddy. Had a nice. That's great. Kind of wanting that, right? Maybe a little fear of rejection, of fear of being found out fear of loss, of, and maybe reputation, and wanting to kind of get some here a little bit, and he's hoping it goes the right way. But the Holy Spirit, which is God as well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, reveals this to one of the church leaders, Peter. 
And it says this, then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? I like that you let. You and I can let the enemy do things to us that we shouldn't let him do. You know, why have you let that done this? You have lied to the Holy Spirit, get that, and you've kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Ouch. This is where now Ananias is like found out, and he's probably a little bit like, uh oh, bummer. Well, I'm sure there's probably gonna be a light warning here, probably, maybe, right? Maybe a stern, like, hey, don't do that again. But what he says, I think it was clear here, and Peter would grab my attention. And when you read the Bible, look for things. This, this, what happens when we lie? You're, he says, it's not, you're not lying to us, Ananias. You've lied first and foremost to the Holy Spirit, to God. You, you're allowing this relationship with him to deteriorate and fall apart because of your lies. Pause. Theology, a little lesson here. I'm a strong believer that nothing can get in the way of God loving you. Nothing. Your, your lying, your sin, your bad habit, your unhealth, nothing can get in the way of God loving you. However, Chris, I knew there was going to be a big but. However, you and I can allow so many things to get in the way of us receiving that love. We allow it. We let distractions in. We start thinking, well, it's not there. He doesn't love me. Where's he at anyways? You know, I'm going to take, take care of myself. I've been wanting something recently, and I've been not getting it. And Ananias, I've been wanting some respect around here, you know. I've been wanting some, some, some nice things in my life. And you know what? I, this is my property. I'm going to go ahead and take it. I'm going to tell them, you know, that, that the money is only this amount. Who cares? They should deal with it. Not knowing that he's, he's just distancing himself from the Lord in this process. You see, when fear is your foundation, you'll be tempted to, da to daily build the false life one lie at a time. You'll just start going down a road of lying. Because all of a sudden, you, you've done it once, and you're like, well, that wasn't too bad, you know. And you, and you won't call it lying. You'll call yourself like, well, I'm not being completely honest, but still I'm being honest a little bit, you know. You know, one thing I've learned about liars, liars will never call themselves liars, ever, Okay. Ever. And really, people will never call themselves liars. We'll call ourselves just other things. Like, well, I'm not telling the whole truth, maybe. But I'm telling some of it. But when we allow this to happen, we start laying this foundation of fear, and we start building upon it, building upon it, building upon it, and it gets easier and easier and easier. As soon as Ananias heard these words, this rebuke from Peter, he fell to the floor and died. What? Yeah. Okay. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. Boom! I mean, like, mic drop. I mean, there's no, like, there's no, like, well, ah, you know, I'm, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. You know, how about a warning, Peter? How about that, right? <laughs> and, and I wanted to be clear here. Peter doesn't kill this dude. No. In God's, and God can do whatever the hell he wants to do. He's God. He decides to go zap to this guy. You go, Chris, that's not fair. You think you're supposed to get a warning at least. <laughs> not this time. Bam. Ananias drops, right? And it's so crazy. Like the young men standing nearby, I don't know who these guys are. They're like, whoa, what should we do? Let's bury him. <laughs> so they go bury him, right? And, and, and this guy is getting buried, and people hear about this story. It's interesting, though, who doesn't hear about the story, but other people are starting to hear about it, and they're like, what in the heck? What is going on? Now, here's where I want to make this point. You and I will think to ourselves that, you know, lying is no big deal. And, and I want to be really clear on how I'm preaching this passage, okay? I am not preaching the point that if you lie, you die. Okay, I'm, I am not doing that, okay? I'm not that guy. I am saying this, that when you lie, it can kill in other ways. That it's not you lie and you die. I'll say this, you lie, it will kill your relationships. It will kill it this way and kill it this way. 
you understanding his love and you really embracing and understanding and giving love to other people. This is where I think about this. See, every little lie that we do, we go ahead and tell ourselves it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's just, I'm just going to go ahead and, and just say this and they'll understand. And then we start even kind of like, you know, with ourselves and with the Lord, we go, you know what, God understands. He forgives me. He's an almighty forgiving God, right? That's totally fine. And, and we start poking holes at this whole, this whole relational thing. And, and, and we go, well, you know, it's okay. This is what life's about. You have to fib a little bit. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. Well, that's a lie right there. Go ahead and say that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble that would be lame and have this whole thing be ruined between me and this person. I'll just lie a little bit on that one. You know, then there's the easy ones. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take off the top, all of these. That's okay. Take a little bit off the top. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not that bit much of a cheating. And we, and we kind of like, you know, look for more ways where we can lie and what, what we can get away with. And we tell ourselves, it's okay. It's not going to do that much. If it's just a little bit of li- And then we get mad when it doesn't work out. Right? Oh, it, we're mad at God. We're mad at, at the person, the people. They did all that. And we don't take into account our part in it. Is it this way all the time? No, I'm talking about when you lie, though. That's what I'm talking about. When you're not being honest with God, first, and you're not being honest with others around you. And, and here's the thing, we, like what does honest with God look like, Chris? It means this, if you're mad at God, if you're sad about what's going on in our world or in your world, if you're just pissed off and frustrated and depressed, show that and say that to God. He can handle it. He can. And I believe he's that father who's looking at us going, I know, I'm mad and pissed off too. I didn't want this for you. I wanted the piano. Surrounded by healthy relationships. I I wanted that. I'm hurting with you. I can handle this. And I feel like a good father that he is. He waits for us at the right time to go, are you done? Can you let me in now? It's going to start though, okay. Friends, get this. If you're going to let me in, it's going to start. If we're going to build something new. It starts with wiping out the foundation of lies. You wipe it out. You be honest with me, I believe God is saying to you and I. You be honest in knowing that I love you no matter what. Stop making up these, these, these beliefs about me that I'm out to get you and ruin your life. Stop believing the other shoe's about to drop and all hell's going to break loose because of the superstitious things you have about, believe about your life. And understand, I am God. And I freaking love you. I want good things for you. And this world is going to suck. It's not heaven, guys. This world is not heaven. It's going to suck. There's going to be death and disease and all sorts of horrible things that happen. But God is still good. And what he's saying to you and I too is that he will be with us in the midst of the suck. Because his presence, you want to know what heaven is? Heaven is not a place. Heaven is the presence of God himself. So wherever God is, is heaven. He makes heaven heaven. And what Jesus, God the, God the Son did on the cross, allowed you and I to have access to heaven now, not when we die someday. That's an elementary faith. The mature faith is that you have Jesus, you have God, you have the Spirit now. In the midst of the suck. That's the honest truth with this way with you and God. And then there's the this way with people. And you go, Chris, it doesn't matter. That This is my sin. My sin or my unhealthy habit, whatever you want to call it, if you don't like church words. You know, it's, it just impacts me. It doesn't impact anyone else. Oh, yeah? Have you read the rest of the story? Well, you're about to. <laughs> it's going to get even worse, okay? So let me go ahead and move forward here. I pushed the wrong button. And Peter said this. Okay, what happens is that his wife steps in. They bring Sapphira in. So Ananias dropped dead, boom. Sapphira, he asked Sapphira, hey, uh, just, just a roundabout question, uh, Sapphira, how much did you sell the property for? How much, did, you know, and, oh, X amount. Was that the full amount? Oh, heck yeah, it was. Heck yeah. And then it says this. <laughs> Sucks. Peter said, how could you, the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit? 
of the Lord like this. The young men who buried your husband, news alert, um, are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. Some commentators said, because of how quickly people had to be buried back then, they give us an, a, a time frame here of three hours, that because, you know, the body stinks, that they would bury right away. That's why the three men rushed out, or not three men, but the young men rushed up to bury the guy. Some commentators say they bury the guy right outside the church office, okay, whatever it was, or the church tent. I mean, so that when people walked in, they had to kind of like walk around him, like, oh, that guy sucks, <laughs> whatever. It sucks to be that guy. And like, and maybe even like, Sapphira walks in around a mound of dirt. <laughs> I wonder who that is. Her husband. That, it, this is, it, horrible story, okay? Horrible story. And, and Peter's like, and I don't think Peter's like loving this. I think Peter's like, the Lord wants to do this right now. Like, Sapphira, hey, are you sure that's the, are you sure that's the amount, girl? You sure? Yeah, just, you, I think about it, you know? And she's like, yeah. Shoot. Hey, young men, get ready. We're burying another one. <laughs> That's coming up next. You know? And then, bam, she dies. Here's my point. Again, I'm saying, I'm not preaching. If you lie, you die. I'm talking about what I'm preaching is if you lie, it's going to kill relationships. And if you think your bad habit or sin only impacts you, you're wrong. It impacts those around you. Point proven. Dead. You see, the false life built upon the foundation of fear will only bring death to your relationships. And I believe Ananias and Sapphira, this is my personal belief, they were ultimately, the foundation of fear was based in a fear of being rejected by this new church community. They were afraid they wouldn't be accepted and be cool as Barnabas. So they wanted to go ahead and fake it till they made it. And hoping they would get by. And this got the Lord, not by Peter. And the Lord, I think, is saying to you and I, don't do this. And specifically, don't do this in here. Not this room, but in the people of God. Relationships between believers. Let's not be people who suck and lie to one another. Let's be people of grace. People of love. Let's let the perfect love of Jesus drive out that fear of rejection or not being looking cool enough. Again, the value and the vehicle we're talking about of managing the distractions in your relationship. And we talked about the value again in that piano and illustration, but what's the vehicle that you need to drive daily? That you need to be in and put yourself in so that you can really manage these distractions, especially the internal ones of fear. So last questions. Last question here says. The value is life-giving and God-honoring. But what's the vehicle that's going to help you live undistracted in your relationships? This is where we're going to go back to Bob Goff here. He's a great storyteller. He tells a story about a vehicle of his own. Check this out. Uh, Because we have uh, this ranch now, the Prius just ain't going to pull a a horse (laughs) or a Brahma bull. And so I decided I'm going to get a pickup truck. And I went down to the pickup truck store. I was so excited. I looked through the window. This pickup truck didn't even have carpet. I'm like, just rubber mats. I'm like, certainly I could afford that. And so I just told the salesperson, I just said, like, I'll, I'll take it. And I got to the pay window. I'm like, no, it was more than half a house. And I'm like, forget that. So I got on Craigslist. I got a pickup truck with 100,000 miles on it for like 25 grand. I'm like, yes. And I got in this pickup truck, and I can't lie, I was feeling pretty boss. And, and, and I, I shut the door, I start driving it, and it smelled like soap. I'm like, what the heck? I mean, beef jerky, okay, you know, Parmesan cheese, maybe, but not soap. And I, it was really bugging me, it was distracting me the whole way at home. So I decided to roll down the windows. I thought, I'm just going to blow this smell out of here. By the time I got home, it was gone. I went inside the next morning, I walked outside, opened up the car door, and it smelled like soap. I'm like, what the heck? Now, I was supposed to go up and marry two people in Los Angeles. Actually, I was officiating, you can't marry two people. That would be a felony. So <laughs> what I decided to do is I was just going to burn it out. I turned the heater all the way as hot as it would go. Three hours up, three hours back, cooked the smell out, got back to San Diego, was gone. 
I went inside the next morning. I woke up. I went outside. I opened the car door, and it smelled like soap. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't even remember driving to the upholstery store. I just pulled into the car place, threw my credit card in the front window, and I just said, like, put any ostrich, leather, I don't care. Just tear out what's in there. We got to have a do-over. Three days later, I came back. I opened the door, and it smelled like dead cow. And so, you guys, I spent $2,000 for this new interior, and I'm just like, I don't understand. That'll happen to you all the time. You'll have something that's so distracting to you. All you can do, identify what that is. What's getting you off message? I'm telling you this. Satan doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to distract you. Destroy you is one and done, but distract you, it's the gift that takes forever. I, I was driving home and it was a little glary outside, so I reached up to get my sunglasses. You guys, I pulled down a 25 cent air freshener. I spent $2,000 fixing a 25 cent problem. Mm. <sighs> that might be you. Relationally, I thought about this. Do you feel like you're spending way too much time trying to fix all the broken in your relationships and getting nowhere? Like way too much time. It's like the same stuff, right? And you're telling yourself, gosh, it just, ah, oh, it's this constant distraction. It's these things that are real, okay? They're not made up. They're real hurts, real pains, real frustrations you have with people and they have with you. But they, it's just, you're not getting past it. You're trying, you're trying to throw all sorts of money or time, which is worth more than money, at it, and it's just not working. You're not seeing something. And I think what you might not be seeing and not be living is truth. It's simply you being honest. I want to simplify it for you so you can understand what it looks like. You see, Jesus again comes with the answers once more. He says, they told the people in John 8 who had faith in him, which I think a lot of you do and online you do. If you keep on obeying what I've said, you truly are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Living a life of truth is made possible by living with the one who is true. Amen. His truth will set you free. It's another Hobby Lobby verse. You go, yeah, it's great. It sets you free. I'm talking about literally in your relationships. His truth will set you free from the shackles of insecurity and the restraints of unresolved conflict. His truth will set you free to love and trust again, even after the pain of the past. And if you're looking for a simple application, just give me something straight, Chris. Like, really easy. What do, how do I apply this to my life this week? And then it comes back to the vehicle that I want to encourage you to put yourself in every day and drive within your relationships. And that vehicle is this. See, try putting yourself in the vehicle of truth. Know it and live it by deciding to be honest. I'm telling you, this is again where Jesus comes into play. Chris, I struggle being honest. I'm afraid of what they're going to do. I'm afraid I might lose them. I'm afraid I might lose everyone. I'm afraid. Friend, that's human and you're not alone. But what are you doing? You're building upon a foundation of what? Fear, and it will come crashing down if you keep allowing that to be your foundation. You must live it. We first know the truth, and that's where you say, Jesus, I want you to come in here. I'm accepting my part in this, and I want you to wipe it clean. And then you want to live it by putting yourself in the vehicle and be honest with people. And this is how you do it. See, I encourage you to try being honest and vulnerable with God and with others. With God first. And with others, second, if, it, you know, for those in the room that I've married, I, I am so blessed to be a part of that amazing day for you. But if I ever marry any of you, you guys come and I officiate your wedding like, you know, like, like, like Bob wouldn't officiate someone else's. If, I, if you guys ever come to me and go, Chris, I want you to marry me, you're going to meet with me three times for three hours, an hour each, at least. Chris, I just want you to marry us. No, 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 I want to hang out with you and talk with you. You're going to go through what I call pastoral care. 
And these pastoral care sessions are three. The first one is conflict management, conflict resolution and management. And the second one's going to be money management. And then the third one's going to be intimacy. Though, you know, Chris, why those three topics? Because whenever I'm dealing with messed up marriages, it's one of those three issues. And fear is found in all three of them. Fear. And what I do on, on week one with you is going to be coaching you, giving you actual shoot from the hip applications on how to deal with the crap, deal with the suck within your relationship with your people, with your spouse or whoever. And it applies to anyone, not just spouses. And the, the, this is what I want you to remember, okay? Be honest and vulnerable. Honest and vulnerable. Honest and vulnerable means this. It really starts with vulnerable. Vulnerable is I feel. It's an I feel statement. Okay, write that down. Honesty is an I want statement. I want this. I want to be honest with you. This is what I want. I want to be truthful with you. And I feel is so difficult to say. I want is so difficult. Most people tell you what they don't want. I just don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to have this, all this crazy in my relationships. Yeah, but what do you want? I don't, and people can't even tell me that sometimes because they've lost track. They've lost hope of believing they can even get what they want ever again. It's very human. But if you can learn how to choose, start, I want, I feel, I feel, I want, and you listen to people, you use I statements. You don't say, you did this to me. You suck. You are horrible. You did blah, 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 blah. It's I. I feel disrespected. I feel not valuable to you. I feel like I am not, I, I'm not someone that you care about. I, I feel so small in our relationship. And I feel a little bit used. I, what I want is I want to know that you love me. I want to know you respect me and care for me. I, I want to know that you believe in me and you care about my dreams too. I want that. I want you to ask me from time to time how I'm doing instead of me always feeling like I'm, I'm asking you how you're doing. And I want you to want to listen to it. I want that. This is an example of how to do I feel, I want, I want, I feel. And you listen as someone says it to you too. So friends, do you want to live the undistracted life in your relationships? Do you? I think you do. If so, then you need to identify what's distracting you. And maybe it is a deep internal distraction of fear. Stop building on that foundation of fear and know the truth so that you can start telling the truth to people. Maybe that's simply what your problem is. You've just built a, lie, a relationship and built on so much lies. And you don't call it lies, but let's be honest. It's, dishonesty is lying. You don't tell all the truth. You're, you're starting to go down the... Right away, the lie path. Be honest. So, and remember this too, what makes life beautiful are the relationships with God that God wants you to have with him and with others. This is what makes life beautiful. You are a piano that is so amazing and so beautiful and you're meant to have people around it for you to experience and really, really produce such a harmony and such an amazing sound that would bring glory to God. And he looks back and goes, yes, that's what I wanted from you, for you from the beginning. This week, guys, we're going to be talking about all of this stuff and get more into the video with Bob Goff. I want to encourage you to get in your life groups. They're only six weeks. You can jump in at any time and jump out. You don't need to be there for all six. This is week three. If you want to know how to get in one of these life groups, they happen on different nights of the week, go talk to someone at Next Steps in the lobby and they'll get you connected this week. And we're going to be talking about this subject. Let's pray. God, we need you, and we love you. God, we ask for your help. We got a lot of fear. It's getting in between uh, us and you. We're afraid that you're mad at us. We're afraid that you're going to hurt us. Father, we thank you for the uh, incredible love, the perfect love that you provide for us. And we ask that you please would just... Would you please remove the foundation of fear that we've built with you and with others? We ask, God, that you would please give us the strength to, to, to really be honest. Give us the, the courage to be honest with you and with those around us. Help us to drive that vehicle and be in that vehicle daily. 
Father, I pray for grace in these relationships in the room and online. I pray that it be evident and experienced. And Lord, we just need your help with these relationships so that we can really live them and remain in them undistracted. In your name we pray. Amen. Guys, we set things up differently today. We're not going to go right to communion. It's going to be a little bit later. We did it on purpose. We felt like this conversation needed to marinate a bit between you and the Lord. So here's the thing. The band's going to be leading us in a time of worship. And if you're new about this, this isn't, this isn't music time, okay? Please don't see it that. Don't see it as sit there like someone's playing at a coffee shop. This is a, this is a group of amazing people who are leading us before the throne to be able to have words that we don't know sometimes or know or how to come up with on screen, to, to present our hearts to God. You can worship standing up, sitting down, kneeling down, hands up, whatever you, however you want to worship. But worship means giving your attention to God. And in this time of worship, ask him to help you be honest here. And then ask him to help you be honest here. May this be the time where the, the foundation of fear is jackhammered out of your life. Don't wait anymore. Let Jesus do it now. And if you need prayer, I'm going to be over there, okay, in that corner over there. And I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you. All right? And I'll, I'll encourage you. Um, Joanna, I need your help. Would you be in that corner to pray with people? Joanna will be there to pray with you over there. She's a good friend of mine. She loves the Lord. She'll listen to you. And this isn't like guys only over here, girls only here. You just have two options. It's wherever you want to go, all right? And we'll listen. And you don't need to give us the whole story, like, hell, here's my whole story. Simply, I need prayer. Because God knows, okay? And this isn't the environment to hear the whole story. We can hear a little bit of it, but he does ask us to ask. So we're going to be asking for you, praying for you, whatever's going on in your life. And let God minister to you that way as we worship him. Amen? Enjoy.